but it's very useful because once that pronouncement has been made, a legal line is crossed allowing us to intervene using our own equipment, our own medications. I don't think in terms of how long do I want to live, just how long can I live. Um, I'm, I'm not quite as far towards the idea of, I don't think I'm like an absolutist and more, a moralist, I'm just going to tr keep pushing the technology and doing everything I can to extend my life. I don't see a point at which I would want to say I don't want to live anymore. If they do have to create their own eternity, they want to create a good one, and so they're laying down the right steps now. Um, and also, if we do develop physical immortality, which is what I think we will develop, um, <clears throat> I think that will bring a built-in incentive for people to live more lives because you could, you know, if you get the death penalty when people are immortal, they can live forever. That's a whole lot worse than the death penalty to a mortal person. I think that the quest for immortality is not only noble, it, it imbues us with a noblesse oblige. That those that achieve this are under an obligation to serve society, to serve back to humanity. And I think that we will have a lot to contribute growing to more than 100,000 members. Since 1980, the Life Extension Foundation is the world's largest organization dedicated to investigating scientific methods for preventing aging and death. Members of the Life Extension Foundation typically are extremely dedicated to maintaining themselves in an optimal state of health. Many of them simply want to live as long as they can without suffering the debilitating effects of aging. Some of them are very hardcore. They actually want to live forever, as I do. They, do. they don't want to die. They don't believe people have to die if science advances fast enough to overcome the molecular changes that are involved in aging and death. Trying to define more accurately the process of aging has been challenging for scientists. While the outward appearance of aging on the human body seems obvious, finding exact biomarkers that accurately measure this process has been elusive. We do age, but we don't age at the same pace. So the question is, why, do we, why are we old at 80 instead of 18? And what's so magic about the number 80? Why not 100? Why not 200? I mean, mice are old at age three. Well, there's a big difference between 80 and 3, but why not longer? The difference must then not be uh, structural, must not be, uh, we don't age because of the passage of time, we age because uh, we have, uh, our biochemistry allows us to age, or we age more slowly because our biochemistry allows us to age more slowly. But I, I, tend, I tend to look more uh, of this process as, as, again, as I said before, as linked to development, uh, which is a well-orchestrated, genetically determined process. And uh, then aging occurs indirectly um, because of this same set of processes. And the pace at which developmental processes occurs then um, also influences the pace in which aging occurs. My current research at UCLA involves supercentenarians, people who are more than 110 years old, because that is the group of individuals who can tell us the secret, if they could, of what are the limits of human lifespan. I think that therapeutic cloning is uh, probably the most practical you know, technique that we have for treating aging, because you can in theory, I mean, even in practice as well these days, take a cell, uh, do nuclear transfer, make embryonic stem cells, and then differentiate those embryonic stem cells into whatever uh, cell types you need to treat, the, you know, whichever disease you want, age-related disease you want to treat. And, um, you know, one example might be, uh, you know, one practical way that, you know, you could treat the whole body possibly would be to make bone marrow stem cells from the embryonic stem cells, from the rejuvenated embryonic stem cells, and then uh, you know seed those young bone marrow cells into the body, and they they will automatically find their way into the into the bone marrow, 
and then because the because it's now known that the bone marrow uh, re, you know replenishes a lot of other cells in the body like in the vascular endothelium then that way maybe you could sort of rejuvenate the vascular endothelium by by uh, make, giving people a younger bone marrow I think the uh, the point of view of Rafal and the Aubrey and the others is basically correct that there may not be one magic bullet, but if we design therapies that will extend human life by 50 years, during those 50 years we can resolve the remaining problems through exponential advancement in science. So it's it's not clear now whether it's going to be a mitochondrial gene therapy vector, uh, genetic nuclear therapy or whether it's going to be a, a chemical compound. I, I don't think that's clear. There's a lot of details to be worked out with the mechanisms. UCLA biologist Dr. Michael Rose established the evolutionary connection between sex and death by breeding fruit flies. Dr. Rose has selected only those flies that reproduced late in life and bred them with one another. The longer it took the insects to reproduce, the longer they lived. He now has flies that live more than 130 days instead of the usual 40. And you go from this almost vertical increase in mortality rates to a, maybe a gentle, gentle increase in mortality rates, a, a bobbling up and down in mortality rates. This is amazing. It's one of the more incredible. I know vast numbers of colleagues in cell biology won't agree with the following statement, but I think that the fundamental scientific issues in aging are largely resolved. By fundamental, I mean really fundamental, the way a physicist would consider them fundamental. Not the way a biologist would consider them fundamental. To a biologist, a new pathway is fundamental. To me, it isn't. Uh, you know, there are lots of pathways, genetic pathways and biochemical pathways in organisms. That doesn't mean that aging isn't a huge practical problem and it's of enormous interest in terms of actually producing interventions in human aging if, you know, the person is interested in that. And I think that's a, as valuable if not more important technological issue than you know building a better internet or a faster car or traveling to the moon or any of those other technological issues what we can accomplish but in addressing problems like uh, traveling to the moon you're solving vast numbers of engineering problems vast numbers of detailed problems and not doing fundamental science um, in the same way I, I regard postponing aging in humans in the same category as taking a person to the moon it will require a vast amount of engineering and a great deal of scientific expertise but it, in itself, it isn't really scientifically fundamental. So I'm a scientist, and what I'm most interested in my scientific research, as opposed to my involvement in any kind of practical activity, is the deepest questions. And the deepest questions to me right now are revolved around biological immortality. What is it all about? Something we really didn't understand existed before the 1990s in organisms like ourselves. We knew that it existed in organisms like sea anemones, um, creosote, juniper, uh, trembling aspen, um, some hydra, uh, simple cilantrate. Uh, nobody was really studying that uh, phenomenon because nobody really cared that much because most people who work on aging do it from a medical standpoint, which means humans, or if not humans, then certainly mammals. Uh, and all these organisms that didn't have an aging process were far removed from mammals. We now know that all mammals, or more precisely all the evidence suggests that all mammals undergo a cessation of aging very late in their life cycle. And from that point on, aging stopped. So that life can be thought of as being divided into three basic stages. The first one is your development growth to maturation. The second part is your aging phase, which starts just about when you're mature, and then continues for a very long time, but then finally stops when you enter a third phase, a phase of biological mortality, in which aging no longer occurs and you have in the case of many organisms, but not all, a very low survival probability per year, which doesn't really systematically degrade with time. And that third phase, which has not really been explored by contemporary biology, is what interests me now, late life.